okay. We still have a few people coming in. We'll, we'll let them join us as they make their way in, but we want to be respectful of your time. And so I show 1130, so we'll get started. My name is Suzanne Jones. I'm the Safe Schools Coordinator here at the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education. I thank you all for um, spending just an hour of your day with us to learn about an important topic that all of our kids are facing right, right now, and that is the online dangers and predators that they run into on the internet. Um, I'm very, very glad to have with us the Morgan Nick Foundation and Genevieve Strickland. You're going to hear from her in just a second. They are an excellent partner, not only on this topic, but anything that deals with the safety of children and, our, and adults in our society. So we're, we're glad to have them with us. Just a couple quick announcements um, as we go through. I want to warn you, we've already had one power outage here in Little Rock this morning, and it was not due to weather. I don't know what's happening. So if we lose power, I am the main host of the meeting. Um, I think. Genevieve would be able to continue on because she's the co-host, but if for some reason um, power fails us this morning and, and we lose the session, we'll make sure we get it recorded and we'll get it up and we'll also reschedule. Um, my goal is to offer these sessions as many times as possible so that as many people as possible um, can get the information. So um, unfortunately, I have no control over power and electric. I've not gotten to that level yet. Um, <laughs> For certificates for the day, if you receive the link for today from a source other than ESC Works or from me, if, you, if it was forwarded by someone else, please send me an email so that I can give you credit for being here today and also so I can track our numbers. Um, I'll put my email address here in the chat in a, in a few minutes once everybody's in, um, but that's how I can give you your, your email or give you your certificate for attendance. And also, I know sometimes that teachers like to gather up in a room together, and you, you may be the one that's playing it for a room full of people. That's totally fine. If you will send me an email and let me know who is in your room, I'll get certificates to everyone. So um, I'm just asking that you be the responsible party to say, yes, this person was in here and listened, you know, for the fidelity of the certificate. Um, we are recording this session. I, I think um, I'm appreciative that Genevieve is letting us record. Once we get it processed and up, it will be on both the Morgan Nick Foundation webpage and my DESE um, Safe Schools webpage. So give us, give us till after May 1st to get it posted, but we will post this recording. Unfortunately, because of grant restrictions, we're not able to share the PowerPoint. So we won't be able to give you the PowerPoint that, that Genevieve is going to use, but you can always come back and look at the recording um, as a reference. And also, um, Genevieve and the Morgan Nick Foundation has worked to develop a curriculum on all aspects of online safety, child safety. Um, that curriculum has got a lot of content in it. That session will be presented at Summit this summer, which is June 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. So you can watch for those dates and look for Genevieve's session um, at Summit. And then I do plan to possibly repeat that session in the fall um, and in the spring so you can have access to the, the curriculum content that they have worked so hard to develop as well. Um, I do want to put in a plug for the um, Arkansas Child Abuse Hotline. Anytime we do a session that speaks to those um, issues that children may you know, reveal to us or confide in us that would um, trigger us to need to make that call, 1-844-SAVE-A-CHILD. Um, that's a number that you probably are all very familiar with as mandated reporters, but it's something that we, we wanna make sure is, is on the forefront. So as we talk about um, the, the content today, or as you see children who may be experiencing some of the things that Genevieve is going to talk about, just remember your obligation as a mandated reporter. So let me check my, my list. I think that's all of the updates I have for you. So I'm going to turn it over to Genevieve and let her take it away. Me unmute there. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you guys for joining us. As she said, my name is Genevieve Strickland. I'm the assistant director here at the Morgan Nick Foundation. And um, I appreciate all of you joining us. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about the foundation for anyone who is joining us that may not be very familiar with what we do and who we are. Uh, we started in 1996, so 25 years ago, because uh, six-year-old Morgan Nick in 1995 had gone to watch a friend play baseball one summer evening at a ball field in Alma, Arkansas. 
while she was there, Morgan was kidnapped. A huge investigation took place. It still takes place today, uh, but Morgan has never been found. So it was during that first year that Colleen realized that uh, Arkansas really did not have an organization that worked with families of missing and or abducted children. And um, she wanted to not ever have another family have to walk that path that she has had to walk. And she also wanted them, uh, if, if it did happen, she did not want them to have to walk it alone. And so she started the Morgan Nick Foundation. We basically, basically we have four incentives. Um, we educate, we do a lot of education uh, in schools with educators, students. We try to reach about 40,000 kids face-to-face -face every year, and then uh, definitely go beyond that in other venues, safety fairs and various other organizations. And then we also do community outreach, community events. We educate for businesses, um, hotels and hospitals, doctors, nurses, all of, all of the above. So really any, anyone who would like some education in these areas. And then we work with families of missing and abducted children. We work with law enforcement supporting them uh, in their search. And we support bills and laws that protect kids and keep them safe. We also added our fourth incentive about a year and a half ago. We work with families of missing and abduct, uh, of missing adults. And um, I don't know how familiar you all are with the laws concerning missing adults, but basically if you're over 18 years old, you have the right to go missing. Uh, you can walk away from everyone, everything you know. You don't owe anyone an explanation, um, and no one has to know where you are and what you're doing. And because of that, oftentimes, if a, a missing, a, if someone goes missing as an adult, there aren't a lot of resources for them, um, unless police feel very confident that there was uh, something nefarious that happened. They really don't get involved because adults have the right to walk away. The problem is, is that that's very rare. Adults very rarely just walk away from everything without an explanation. But again, there aren't a lot of resources to help those families. And so uh, we started working with families of missing adults about a year and a half ago. And I believe we are the only organization in the United States that does that. So. We wear a couple of different hats and try to do as much good as we possibly can. Um, so I wanna talk to you guys today about uh, something that we get a lot of, of questions about, a lot of um, people that are asking questions about internet safety. It is one of the biggest issues we have regarding child safety today. Um, everybody is familiar with the internet. Um, they use it on a daily basis. Kids use it on a daily basis. It's a great tool when it's used properly. The problem is that this is something that has come into our world very quickly and it's grown and advanced very quickly, but we have not educated and uh, kept up with the advancements education-wise as quickly as we may have needed to. Um, I wanna pause real quick and just say, if you have any questions or comments during this, please feel free to uh, send them and we will answer any of those as quickly as we can while we're, we're working through this presentation. Um, and please feel free to be as interactive as you want. Ordinarily, I do this live and it's very interactive. And so uh, trying to transition, transition this to a very quiet Zoom is kind of a, a difficult transition for me. So yeah, feel free to make any comments or, or ask any questions that you want. Um, so again, talking about internet safety, it is a tool that we use every day and it's a great tool. I'm not here to tell anyone 
hey, your best bet is to get off the internet, get kids off the internet, everyone will be safe and we'll be good to go because that's just not realistic. Um, it's something that we uh, utilize and I can't imagine life without it at this point, but it does carry with it a lot of dangers, a lot of dangers for even us as adults, but even more so for our children. Um, you guys are probably on there using a variety of apps, a lot that you see on your screen right now. One of the problems that we have is that not everything with the internet is as it seems, especially when we talk about online apps. You know, online apps tend to present themselves in one way. If you go to an app store to maybe search out an app that your child is interested in, um, you read the definition of it and it may sound great, right? Uh, the problem is we don't always know what the real intention behind those apps are or how maybe other people or kids are using these apps. And so with that uh, presents a lot of problems when it comes to technology and safety. There are things that kids do when they are online that puts them in danger. It makes them stand out to, um, it makes them stand out to predators. They take note of them. Um, it makes them search out these kids that they might otherwise pass by. We call those risky behaviors. Um, if kids are sending mean or rude messages, if they are sharing inappropriate photos, if they're talking about adult subjects visiting adult websites uh, or inappropriate websites, or if they're talking with people online that they don't know. These things, these four behaviors, risky behaviors, really accentuate a child's chance of being stalked by an internet predator. Um, I use the term stalked because that's exactly what's going on. Predators, you know, kids use the term, um, I Facebook stalked them or I Insta stalked them, um, meaning that they go on someone's social media and they really search them out, um, try to find out who it is that they are, who are they friends with, who are they dating, what do they do in their spare time, um, all of those things, uh, you can pretty much go to someone's social media and get most of the information that you need to get about someone pretty easily. And um, so that's what the term, you know, Facebook stalked or Insta stalked someone means. So the problem with that is it's all, you know, kind of funny for kids when they talk about doing that and they do it innocently. It's just a way of getting to know someone. But the thing is, predators are doing that as well. Predators are stalking these kids to get to know them. And these behaviors that they put out there, if they're sending mean or rude messages or sharing inappropriate photos, um, talking to people online, uh, that just gives these predators more information about them. What makes this so risky, besides the fact that they give away a lot of information about themselves for these predators to use, what they're essentially doing is letting a predator know, I'm willing to do things I'm not supposed to. You know, that's exactly what predators are looking for. They're looking for kids who are willing to do things that they're not supposed to because that's exactly what they're going to try to have them do. They are going to try to have them do things that they aren't supposed to be doing. And if you're doing things you're not supposed to, then typically you're probably going to lie about what you're doing to your caregivers. You're probably not going to tell the whole truth. You know, pretty rarely do you do something that you shouldn't, that you're just very openly forthright with your parents about doing at that age? So um, they're willing to lie. And then 
also it says um, that they might not have quite the um, parameters that they need to have. If they're, you know, doing things they shouldn't online and they're lying about it, they probably aren't being monitored quite as uh, strictly as maybe they need to be or, or uh, could be while they're online, which again is another flag for a predator because they want to target kids who aren't being monitored online, who have a lot of free reign. That's just beneficial to a predator. So these risky behaviors really send out messages to online predators about uh, who they can target and who might be easy for them to target. So predators, when they are talking to kids, we call that grooming. They are basically, it's what the word means. They are preparing them for something the way you prepare yourself when you groom. Um, so they are preparing, they're grooming them. And they start online by uh, talking with them, developing a, a friendship with them. And what I always say to parents or adults when I do these presentations is, if you think that your child isn't talking to people online that you don't know, you are, are greatly naive because they are. I have yet to go into room full of kids and ask that question, do you talk to people online that you don't know? It is almost 100%. And eventually, often, the couple of kids who try to say that they don't talk to people online they don't know, uh, let it spill that they do or they have. So this is definitely something that they are doing, and it doesn't matter how much we tell them not to, how much we explain the dangers, they're still doing it. I think that comes a lot from being behind the screen. You know, I can't see your faces. I um, am just talking to you, or maybe we're texting, you know, we've got a chat box, we can chat back and forth. It makes it easy to feel very safe and secure when you're at your home behind a screen, uh, you don't really feel in danger to talk to someone you don't know, even though you've been told not to and you've told what the dangers are, there's still that false sense of security. Because um, you got to keep in mind, we're t you know, if we're talking about kids on the internet, um, these kids are not, they're not toting uh, fully developed brains yet. And so, you know, that's why we have the laws that we have here in the U.S. that say, you know, you have to be 18 or 21 to do certain things because we don't feel like these kids are qualified yet. We don't feel like their capacity to make really serious decisions, life-altering decisions, um, are, that they're quite ready to do that until they're at least those ages, 18 and older for various things. So it's the same thing with, you know, internet. They're, they're not quite ready to make some of the decisions that they're making. Um, so these online predators groom these kids. They, like I said, they go online, they get as much information, they stalk them, they pile up the information, um, take notes and develop a relationship with them and understand, depending on what age kids we're talking about, it doesn't take much to develop that relationship with them. You know, a kid talks to them a couple of times and now they're not a stranger anymore. They're not someone they don't know. They're a friend and they're someone they know. Therefore, now they are justified in talking to them. They don't even, you know, have to pretend that, uh, it's not okay. So while they're talking to them, they're feeding them everything that they want to hear. They flatter them. They build them up. All the things that 12, 13, 14 year old you wanted at those ages and needed, uh, the self-esteem, the compliments. Um, oftentimes they'll think that of them as in a relationship, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. 
And so they develop those bonds with them. They flatter them and build them up. And whatever it is that each kid needs to hear, an online predator has figured that out and they are giving them exactly what they need to hear. And it builds that bond. Eventually, these predators will start to send them gifts typically. And the gifts can be anything. They might be um, a designer purse that someone wanted. It might be tickets to a concert. It might be as simple as movie tickets. Um, they might send them their favorite candy. Oftentimes though, that gift ends up being a cell phone. Uh, it might be a track phone, a, a type of throwaway phone. Um, they pay for it. They pay for the bill for it or the minutes for it. Uh, and now they can be in constant contact with this child and no one has to know. No one has to, to know the amount of time they're spending texting or talking on the phone to each other. Um, parents can check their other phone and they're not seeing it there, so they're unaware of it. Uh, often it's a cell phone. And then they'll eventually begin to, to talk about adult subjects, um, <clears throat> inappropriate subjects, things that the kid may be uncomfortable with in the beginning. So they just throw it into conversation to try to uh, make that a comfortable and, and okay, safe topic. And as they go, these adult subjects or inappropriate discussions get bigger and bigger. They might ask them to keep it a secret. Hey, you know, we're really close and we don't need to tell anybody the things that we discuss on here um, or the two of us discuss or this is how boyfriends and girlfriends work. They talk about all of this stuff and um, they keep it private. So, you know, that's what we need to do. You really don't need to even tell your friends because, you know, your parents, they don't understand. They don't get it. They don't know how it works. People meet online now. That's just the, the time we're living in and they're old school. They don't understand it. So I wouldn't tell them anything. And your friends, well, they're just going to be jealous. They, they're just wishing they had the kind of relationship that we do. So let's keep this quiet and just between us and uh, that'll be what's best for both of us. Uh, and then they'll start to work on turning them against their family and friends. They might start to, you know, say those things, your, your parents don't get it, your friends don't get it, I'm the only one that understands you, I'm the only one that listens to you. Eventually after that, they're going to use guilt to get to them. Guilt's a huge factor, it's big with uh, adults, it's even bigger with kids. We've all had guilt thrown up on us, probably often by parents, but um, guilt is something that has a lot of power with kids. And so they might start to make them feel guilty um, if they're not turning to them enough, not talking to them enough, if they're going out with other friends more when they could be sitting at home texting them. Um, they begin to, to put that guilt pressure on them. And then again, start to ask for images that are revealing or um, inappropriate. They might start by sending an appropriate photo, an inappropriate photo to them and ask for one back. Um, and you know, it's hard in these discussions for people to understand why a kid would do that. Why would they send it? And I get lots of parents that say, oh, my child would never do that. They would never send that. And I hope that they wouldn't. But odds are they probably have already or definitely would. Um, we see it all the time. There are hundreds of thousands of these photos floating around. Um, they are willing to do it. They feel like this person really loves me. They care about me. They've been there for me. Um, they give me gifts. They, you know, 
they're there when no one else is. If all they want is a picture, I, that's something I can give them. I can't give them much, but I can give them that. And honestly, in our society today, that is made to be such an okay thing. They see it in movies and in television. Um, you know, the Kardashians do it. Why shouldn't I do it? So it's made to be such an okay thing that most kids are completely willing to do it. So we've got, let's say a child who does this, they share an inappropriate photo, time goes on, maybe they haven't uh, kept this relationship going as strongly later. Maybe this person asks for more pictures. And this time the child is, says, mm, no, I don't think I'm gonna do that anymore. That's when a predator says, oh, yes, you will do that. You'll give me whatever I ask you to give me. You'll do whatever I ask for, or I'll take the picture I have or the pictures I have, and I'll post them all over the internet. I'll post them all over social media. I'll send them out to your friends, to your parents. Yeah, I've got their information too. And they'll know exactly what you've done and what kind of person you are. So you'll do whatever I tell you to do. That's what is happening often for kids today. It's called sextortion, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. It's a, a form of blackmail. Um, basically, you know, what kids need to do is to not engage someone who does that, block them, um, for sure do not meet them on, offline somewhere and you need to tell a trusted adult. These are the steps that you would give to a child who maybe has found themselves in that same in that situation. Same thing if it's just uh, someone online that's trying to reach out and talk to them that they don't know. Um, don't engage them, don't accept their friendships, block them, don't meet them you know, somewhere for sure and let a trusted adult know that someone you're uncomfortable with is reaching out to you. Report it for sure um, to the cyber tip hotline. Let them know that that's happening. I always tell kids, um, you know, I get that you're really smart and you know what you're doing and you know uh, not to, you know, talk to people like that. The problem is your little brother or sister or cousin, they may not know that stuff yet. So even though you don't talk to somebody that you've met online, um, you block them, that's great. That's what you should do, but you need to report them as well. And the reason is because you don't want them going after your younger siblings or cousins. And that is exactly what they'll do. They'll just move on from you to the next person, to the next person until they find someone who will engage them. So it's really important that you turn them in. So we talked a lot about the, you know, the risky behavior online that stands out. Um, part of that is, pro is posting inappropriate things. And of course, these photos are inappropriate that you shouldn't be uh, posting and visiting sites that have these inappropriate photos. But some of the other inappropriate content that you'll see online with these kids all the time is, you know, drinking and drug use. It is amazing when I talk to kids how much they don't know about what's okay and what's not with this stuff. Drinking, I always ask them, how old do you have to be to drink alcohol? I get a lot of 18, 16, it's 21, right? So if you're posting pictures that even just appear that you're drinking alcohol, that is inappropriate bordering illegal activity online. For sure, if you're under, you know, drinking age, it's illegal. Um, same with, you know, posting drug use or even vaping. If you're under the age, that's illegal, inappropriate content. You know, hate speech, Lewd and uh, offensive gestures, flipping someone off. There's lots of kids who like to do that in a profile picture. Um, 
the use of profanity. Lots of kids will have foul language in their profile pictures. Um, any of that kind of stuff, threats that you make online that even if you're saying, oh, it was a joke or I didn't mean it like that, uh, it's inappropriate, sometimes illegal content. Besides the fact that it's risky behavior that stands out to these online predators, one of the things that kids are really not being made aware of is how dangerous this is to their future. Most universities and businesses now hire people that their sole job is to search you out online before they hire you for a job or before they uh, accept you into their college or university. So they've got people that are sitting around with an application from Joe Blow and they're searching out everything they can get off of the internet about him. And they find his social media and see parties that he's been going to. They see that his name has Profan his username has profanity in it, um, jokingly, you know, making offensive gestures in photos that he's got on there, all inappropriate, some illegal. They're going to look at that and consider it as much or more in part of his application as his grades or his ACT score. So, this kind of behavior online can have devastating and lasting effects on these kids and they don't realize or understand what kind of an effect it can have on them. In 2017, there was 125 students that were getting ready to start a college at the University of Harvard University and um, they received letters in August stating that they were no longer welcome to, tent, to attend Harvard University based on their online usage over the summer. This is becoming a real thing. Kids are losing scholarships. They're being told that they are no longer welcome to attend universities. Um, same thing with jobs. You know, businesses, I know pretty much every school that I go into I'm told that they search out their teachers online while they work there and before they hire them. Um, I had a principal that I went to uh, talk to the students at that school and he called me in his office and he said, I wanna tell you a story. He said, I interviewed a woman recently who had been teaching for about 10 years. And she wanted to move to this district and he said, while I was interviewing her, I pulled her name up uh, on social media to search her out, which I do for everyone. And he said, I noticed her Facebook page. She had a photo of herself back on, in college on spring break. And uh, she was standing on a beach. She had a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. She was in a bikini. And he said, I turned the monitor around and said, do you want this person teaching our students? Because we don't here and we will not hire you. The interview is over. People do not want uh, certain types of images representing their businesses. They don't want certain political beliefs and views to be what stands out about their business. And so, um, these kinds of behaviors that we see online are going to profoundly affect people's futures. A lot of businesses now require that their employees sign a social media waiver, um, basically says that um, the business has the right to fire you if they're not in agreement uh, over what you do on your social media, what you post or what you say. They don't want other people to associate you with where you work and what you do and assume that that is the belief of that business. The same thing for kids with the content that they post, you know, universities don't want to be on Good Morning America trying to explain 
the behavior of these underage kids and why the university didn't catch it sooner when it's posted all over their social media. So those kinds of things are greatly going to affect students um, and it, it will continue to get harder on them as time goes on. Sexting, this is a big one in schools and for kids. Um, sexting is where you take inappropriate photos, inappropriate uh, videos, um, basically nudity or nude, you know, specific body parts that are nude and you send them through technology. So this is a huge, huge problem in schools and amongst kids. So I'm gonna ask a question, hopefully we can kind of get an answer. I know you guys are um, muted and you can send it in or unmute your mics. At what age do you think these kids are sexting? What do you think the primary age of when it starts is? 10. 10, okay. For you. Any other comments on that? It's way too young for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. I'm trying to think of the age uh, that I think that's about right, nine, 10 years old. It is fourth and fifth grade is when it is rampant for kids and sexting. Fourth and fifth grade still blows my mind. Um, I think we were playing kickball when I was in fourth or fifth grade and these kids are sexting. Um, oddly enough, by the time they get to high school, they've kind of stopped. And a lot of people tend to think this is what high school kids are doing. Um, but high school kids take on it is been there, done that. They did that a long time ago and they're over it now and they're preparing for other things. And so fourth and fifth grade is when it is rampant and we will get middle schools calling our office saying, oh my gosh, these kids are sexting like crazy and we can't get them to stop. We need you guys to come in and, and talk, talk with them and, and uh, try to get, you know, put a damper on this. So it is a big deal amongst these younger kids. I think a lot of it is they want to do what they think the big kids are doing. And this is what, you know, they think makes them cool, makes them big kids. And so that's what they do. Um, Arkansas law, I don't know if you guys knew that we have Arkansas law about sexting though. And basically what Arkansas law says, if you are 14 years old or older, you can get a felony for sexting or knowing about sexting material. And if you get a felony for that, then you will then be required to register as a sex offender for the rest of your life. That's a lot to carry with you for the rest of your life for a mistake um, made at a very young and vulnerable age. But that's what we've got going on. Um, we've got a lot of kids that are taking that chance and most of them are unaware that it's illegal. It's illegal because it's child pornography. You are under 18 years old, you're legally a minor, and any kind of nudity like that is considered child pornography and therefore uh, against the law. So a lot of kids will try to maintain, well, it's my body, therefore I have the right to do what I want. Um, I can make that decision, but the truth is you can't make that decision. Um, because uh, you're a minor.
So, um, you know, some of the things that I talk with kids about, um, you got to consider once you've sent it, you no longer have control over what happens to it. These photos get lost and, and passed around with to people that you were not aware of. They are used to bully and blackmail, um, not to mention just the psychological and emotional damage that they do to kids who aren't prepared to have to deal with something like this. Um, you know, you don't know who screenshotted it. You don't know who saved it. Uh, it's, it's a very dangerous game to play and it is causing a lot of havoc amongst kids, um, especially the bullying and blackmailing of these photos as they get out. It does a lot of emotional and psycho psycho psychological damage to these kids. Um, if you know that there's sexting material out there and it's with underage kids, just knowing about it, you're required by law to turn that in. If you don't and it gets back that you knew about it, you can get a felony for that. So that's a really scary thing that most people are unaware of. Just knowing about it and not turning it in, um, can cause you problems the rest of your life because it is child pornography. It is illegal to be aware of child pornography and not turn it into authorities. So you are required to let someone in authority know about it. You can go to your um, re school resource officer and let them know, hey, I've, I've heard there's photos going around of so-and-so. I don't know if it's true. I've just heard them talking about it in the hall or whatever. Um, and let them deal with it, but you've got to let someone in authority know to make sure that, that you are dotting all your I's and crossing your T's. Um, same thing with kids. Kids are required to let others know if that's happening. You know, that's when they'll use apps that pictures disappear or they think they can be anonymous and not traced. Um, and that goes back to a lot of things aren't as they appear to be. It's pretty hard to, to find anything that is untraceable and um, that you can't track down. And it's the same with these apps. Um, they're traceable and they can easily find out who's been viewing this stuff and sharing it and passing it along. So um, that's one thing that we really try to emphasize not to be mistaken is that um, it can be traced and it can be, you can be caught uh, doing that. So you did a thing. You sent a picture of yourself with no clothes on. Something you thought wouldn't be shared. And in a polite society, cats wear clothes, right? Anyway. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Now things have gone wrong, terribly wrong. 
Maybe you shared the picture with someone you loved and trusted, but after a while, things weren't so friendly. Or they said they'd help you become a star. They just wanted to use you. Or maybe you met someone online and they really seemed to understand you. But then it got weird. And it turned out to be someone totally different. Now the person you shared the pic with is demanding more and threatening to tell. That's sex worship. Yep, that's the thing. The perpetrator relies on you feeling ashamed and keeping quiet. But they are the ones who should be ashamed. What they are doing is wrong. And it's never too late to find your voice to ask for help or too early to reach out to your friends to tell them you'll be there no matter what. In fact, you can stop sextortion before it starts by talking about it now. With support, you can do anything and you can focus on the important business of being cats. So tell your closest friends today, you've got their back no matter what. So what to do if something like this happens, definitely uh, let a trusted adult know, let someone in authority know, file a complaint um, with any of these organizations um, and they can, can help you from there. Um, sadly, you can't get the photos back, but you do need to take action and um, it's important. Lots of times kids are embarrassed and um, they're afraid to tell someone, so uh, if they confide that in you, be sure to let them know it's not the end of the world. There's help out there that can help them with that situation and help them recover from it. This is kind of a lot how it tends to look uh, with these kids. Sorry. Um, something like that happens. I love to ask the kids um, when I show them that video who they'd hate to see their photo more, their little brother, their mom, the creepy internet guy. Almost 100% of the time they say their mom, that would be the worst. Um, and that's often what ends up happening. Um, these videos get around and, and people that you're uncomfortable with and don't want to see it end up seeing it. So that's basically what sextortion looks like. It's uh, videos, pictures that are taken or sent that get into the wrong hands. And then they are used um, for sexual exploitation or an abuse of power 
with kids, uh, usually for something, obviously for something, it's extortion, um, but usually it's for uh, sex in, in return. Victims are targeted, images are, are obtained, and then they use them to get what they want from the person, whether it's um, money, sex, sexual favors, um, that's the primary use of it. Um, the threats are real. Studies have shown that uh, more than 50% of kids have sent or been sent some form of sexting photo, an inappropriate photo in some, some form or fashion. Um, and those numbers are continuing to climb. The impact of it, of course, is uh, can be detrimental to kids. Um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of embarrassment, um, depression, uh, bullying happens. The rate of dropping out of school increases quite a bit by a kid who is being extorted. Um, and then self-harm increases greatly by someone who is being sextorted. Um, Ms. Genevieve, we've what, got a couple. We've got a couple yeah. questions in the chat, if you don't mind. Um, the first one I, says, is the sexting at nine to 10 years of age because of puberty? Or do you think it's because of the change from elementary to secondary school? Do you have any insight on, on why it's, it's happening at that age? I think that it is something that Again, kids want to try to keep up with older kids. You know, they're always looking to be older than what they are. And I think that's one reason that they're doing it. Um, puberty has a little bit to do with it, but for the most part, that's one thing that we found in studies is it really doesn't play that big of a role. Um, you know, kids that aren't developed yet really in any way are sending out photos like this. So really it has more to do with that mentality of this is how you keep a boyfriend or a girlfriend. This is how you make them interested in you. Uh, this is what big people do, older people do um, to in relationships and they're always looking to, to appear older than they are. Someone suggested in the chat curiosity you know, the world at their fingertips, so they're... Exactly, yeah. You know, we talked, I talked one time doing some, we do a lot of education with law enforcement, and we were doing this once, and law enforcement, uh, I had a guy in there that said once, you know, it's not much different than we were kids, um, than when we were kids, you know, we had to take a picture with a camera, and you had to send it off to get it developed, and then you're taking a chance your mom would see the pictures because they're going to be paying for it and picking it up. And so we wouldn't do that. But they did, you know, we did other things back then because of that curiosity. There were games and, you know, various things like that that we did. And so um, it's not a lot different from back then. It's just the venue and the tools that we have to do it are different. You know, we've got readily uh, made pictures at our fingertips so it makes it easier to do. There's some conversations going on in the chat that are good, but I want to ask one other question that was posed. Mm -hmm. As a school counselor, do you think it's appropriate to start these conversations with our third graders? We don't, here at the foundation, we don't start teaching sexting until um, fifth grade. Um, we're kind of starting to move back into fourth grade a little bit as we see it happening. Uh, but, but the sexting issue, we don't really discuss a lot in, in younger kids. Um, we do internet safety for third and fourth graders. I don't think it hurts to talk about inappropriate things because um, unfortunately, these kids are getting sent inappropriate things if they're online and on social media, and a lot are on social media at that age, they're being exposed to it. I mean, there's no doubt they're being exposed to inappropriate things. So I think it doesn't hurt to talk about that in general, 
Um, I think it's just a matter of how much depth you get into at that age. And right now, we don't go into a lot of depth about inappropriate. We, we mention, um, you know, don't send inappropriate photos. And if someone sends you one, you need to tell a trusted adult. But that's about the extent of what we go into with them. All right, so moving on from uh, the sex extortion, one thing that I always want to cover with that is that uh, I want to make sure that people understand what our laws are. And our law, you know, what the law says is that an underage child cannot legally consent to sex, sexual activity, or pornographic pictures. So the idea of saying, well, it was um, a consent by them, it was mutual consent, that doesn't wash. That is not legally okay. Um, they cannot consent to any of that behavior as an underage child. So we can't use that and make it okay. Um, sextortion with predators they spend a lot of time trying to have this behavior with kids. Um, they spend many hours a day searching out victims that they can extort online uh, using pictures. Um, they have a, uh, they have files that they have set up that they are using to keep notes um, on them. Um, they are spending a tremendous amount of time trying to find these kids to do this too. So this is not something that's in passing and a quick thing. Um, maybe I'll find a kid, you know, here in a couple of minutes. And if I do great, and if not, fine. They're spending a bulk of their time doing this uh, to try to find these kids and to exploit them. The thing with the sextortion is that it leads to one of our bigger problems that we have going on now, and that's sex trafficking. It is a, a huge problem that we have going on around the world. Sex trafficking is basically a form of slavery. It is modern day slavery. We have more slavery due to trafficking in the world today than we've ever had before. Um, it's a big problem. and. Basically, the order of events that we've gone through today is how it leads up to trafficking in our world today. A lot of people tend to look at trafficking, sex trafficking, um, kind of the way the movie Taken depicts it. And although there's true elements to that and how it works and it happens that way, um, in the United States, it happens more out of an extortion and blackmail like we've talked about events. This is what it looks like. Um, it's such a big problem. That's why Arkansas legislators said educators have got to have education on trafficking, what it looks like, how it looks for kids, how they get involved, um, because you're going to see it. The average age of someone who's being trafficked is 12 years old, 12 to 14 years old incredible and while they're being trafficked it's on an average of seven to ten years you know it is second only to the sale of illegal drugs very quickly will take over the number one spot um it is you know i put it in terms of i can sell you a bag of drugs one time and i'm done but i can sell a person 15 times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and on average make $80,000. So trafficking is a big issue um, that comes out of the sextortion. If you think that someone is uh, being trafficked, a student is a mandated reporter, you are required to call the child abuse hotline and turn that in. Uh, there is also a national human trafficking hotline that you can report to as well, but um, you're required to turn that in the same as you would child abuse. Um, 
it is a huge problem and we see it only increasing and getting worse. It leads to uh, a sex extortion, leads to, we talked a little bit about cyberbullying, creates a lot of problems with people being bullied, kids being bullied, which then often leads to uh, teenage runaway events um, where kids feel like their only option is to get away, to run away. More than 2 million kids run away every year. 5,000 of those runaways um, will die on the streets. Within 72 hours of a child running away, they will be sexually trafficked. Um, for kids, it's a means of survival a lot of times. They need food, shelter, that kind of thing. And so they will uh, maybe do it one time so that they can get food or money to buy food, but that's all it takes until they're, ex and then they're exploited beyond that. So this is a huge problem. Um, you know, if you know someone that might be in trouble in that way, the uh, Runaway Safe Line is a great source of help for them. And that number uh, has lots of information, a wealth of knowledge there. They've got counselors that can talk to anybody about anything pretty much. So it's a huge help when dealing with issues like that. Ms. Kennedy, I'm gonna, Yeah. Oh, I'm, are you almost, are you at the end? I am at the end, yeah. I think we are right at our time, maybe a couple of minutes over, so. You did perfect. I was just about to have to, to kind of say we're getting close to the end. Um, for those of you, let me do a couple housekeeping things. For those of you who have to jump off, thank you. We appreciate your time. We want to be respectful if you need to move on to class or duty or some of those other things. Um, as, if y'all want to stick around and have some questions with Ms. Genevieve, I'm sure she, she would be up for that. If you did not get this link from either me or ESC Works, please email me and I've put my um, information in the chat. That way I can make sure everyone gets their certificate. I just want to make sure that um, that if you were here, you get credit for it, and everyone will um, that's attended will get a certificate. So um, that information's in the chat, and I'm going to let it go back to Miss Genevieve, and y'all can do question and answer, and y'all can jump off as you need to. All right. So, do you guys have any other questions or anything that you uh, wanted to talk about with this? We'll wind it up. All right, well, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, if you guys do have any questions or anything, if you want us to come to your school or um, do any uh, teacher workshop stuff, we would love to be a part of that. Um, I didn't cover sex trafficking and uh, some other things we do a little bit more in depth just because of the time restraints today. But hopefully you guys learned some things and found some things that might be helpful to you. Again, if you have any questions or need any things, please, please reach out to our office. We are more than happy to work with you in any way we possibly can. There are two questions in the chat. One asks, oh. what is the legal age of consent? Um, 18. Uh, it actually 16. Um, it's different in every state as far as like, I guess it kind of depends on what you mean by legal consent to. There are some Romeo laws about marriage um, in Arkansas at age 16 and 17 um, that they're legally able to consent. But as far as just uh, like the sex uh, uh, consenting and um, sex sexting photos, which are, it's considered porno, pornographic, child porno, pornography. Sorry, I can't talk. It's considered child pornography as long as they're a minor. You can't consent to that. And then the other question is that, uh, it says just a question about reporting it. After mm -hmm. we report it to the SRO, do we do anything from there? To my knowledge, no. You might be able to address that a little bit better than I. So my, my take from uh, an educator standpoint is um, 
if you feel that the child is in a, a situation that could lead to abuse, then I think it's always wise to report to the child abuse hotline because um, even if it's a sexting photograph, there could be, that could be signs and overlying signs of something else that's happening. Um, and it's always better to get the authorities involved as soon as possible. We'd hate for a sexting um, event at age 11 or 12 to wind up being a trafficking, trafficking event at age 13 or 14. So um, to that respect, I don't know if there's a lot of laws that govern that you have to report on sexting, but as mandated reporters, we're faced every day of making those decisions of where is that line on suspected abuse. And my heart just always leads me to err on the side of caution and report for the, the safety of a child and trying to uh, intervene as soon as possible. Are there any other questions? I think our numbers have gotten down below 50. If you'd like to unmute and ask a question or pop it into the chat. And we, we may be down to those solid 20 or 30 that just will not leave because they don't want to miss even a question and an answer. So <laughs> thank you all for um, attending. If you're not on my listserv and you would like to be to learn about upcoming sessions, um, send me an email. That information's in the chat as well. And with, without anyone else popping up a question or unmuting, then we will call this um, a fabulous workshop and send you on for the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. We appreciate it.